I think it's important to see not just in Western countries, um, but if you mean um, Europe and North America, you see certain rallies all over the world. So clearly, um, it resonates with them. Uh, and you see this not just in relation to um, the rallies, but also the actions of many for governments, like for example, Latin American governments, or the South African government, which has consistently been against Tel Aviv's policies towards the Palestinians, because it sees apartheid that it fought against in South Africa being reenacted on the Palestinians. And in that way, for many people, the Palestine um, suffering and the Palestine um, uh, attacks on the Palestinians remind them and resonate with them on their own experience of colonialism or racism or their own experience of repression and their own experience of the possibility of cruelty towards them as gov many governments um, refuse to acknowledge um, their humanity. So I think it's really a revolt against dehumanization of the neoliberal order and, and, and you'll see when you go to these marches they're not just there are many, many Jewish protesters, there are many, many Muslim protesters, there are many, many um, atheist protesters. And what combines them isn't, isn't just one thing, it's a family of different things. But they see in that something that affects us all. One could argue that because the Bosnian genocide was allowed, and it was allowed, then it became easier to do the Rohingya genocide. And because the Rohingya genocide, and the Rohingya is quite important because it was carried out by Myanmar, Burma, which is a very um, weak country, much weaker than many Muslim countries. But the failure of Muslims or others to do even something about that genocide, it means that you have lowered the threshold of the level of violence that you can commit against Muslimness in the world. I want to thank you for your solidarity, your clear, unwavering support from the minute this war began. I mean, there's a zombie neoliberal order that nobody believes in it anymore, nobody actually thinks about it, but they will still carry on eating our brains and hearts and things like that because that's all they do. And right now, I would argue that in the world today, there is a need for a new vision and there is no new vision coming. The resistance to the attempted genocide in Gaza opens up the possibility of a new vision of a better world, a vision that was lost in Bosnia that wasn't taken up in Rohingya, wasn't taken up with the Chechens, wasn't taken up on so many different cases with the Uyghurs. I think it's really, really important to remember that in many places in Islamistan, it is impossible to have these rallies as well. So for example, you couldn't have a ra ra rally if you wanted to in Riyadh. I mean, you can watch a Shakira concert, but you can't have a rally in terms of Palestine. However, even in those countries, there have been massive rallies uh, wherever they've been possible. And many, many governments have tried to restrict that because they realize that the only thing that can topple them is people's power. So they're afraid of the people gathering and recognizing their power. And the solution is this, that part of the job of organizations like yours um, and org uh, is to actually enlighten and educate the people in political struggle. Because it's not something that just happens. It requires work, it requires knowledge, it requires looking at the possibilities of boycotts, for example. Boycotts have worked, they will work, but they're not the only thing. The reason why you have to resort to boycotts is because that's the only thing you can control because you cannot force your governments 
to take a more rigorous action directly. If people, either they don't have the intention or they don't have the capability or the knowledge. So part of the process of the struggles is to be in, in, engaged in a conscious raising and educating ourselves in the possibilities of a better world and learning how to do this by looking at the examples of others. So how many people know the struggle, for example, of um, people like Malcolm X or the struggle of the Algerians or the struggle against how the anti-colonial struggle, Imam Shamil, all of these things are lost to us because our educational, we, we don't, we're not taught them. So all of that reservoir of resistance is lost. So part of the work must be to educate ourselves, to hope, to think that you can change things and you have a duty to change things. I suggest the decolonization of ourselves, I suggest the decolonization of knowledge, I suggest that the decolonization has to be deeper than we are allowing it to be. And through the decolonization, confidence will grow. So for example, nearly every single military in the members of the OIC, with one or two exceptions, is completely constructed with the logic of the Western militaries. At the same time, their actual institutional memory, they won their um, honours by killing and repressing other Muslims for the most of the time. And that's what they've been doing. Egypt, Algeria, Pakistan, Indonesia, all of that. When you are confronting problems, if you don't have that critical knowledge or that criticality built in, you will try and resolve problems depending on the book, on the manual that tells you how to resolve problems. The real issue is this, can we allow a Muslim political subjectivity to emerge which is transnational, which is future orientated and which is confident enough. Without that we are still, we are on the Titanic moving the chairs and someone may be in a good chair and someone may be in a bad chair but the ship will sink and we will all sink with it.